Hello, welcome, welcome. So in this series, we're building a retro video display processor for hobby CPUs. And if you've missed the previous couple of episodes in this series, I suggest you go back and watch them for extra context on this episode. In this episode, we're going to be talking about palettes and converting pixels into colors on the screen. So in the previous episode, we covered getting those colors onto the screen. And in this episode, we're going to be exploring the palette. So the goal with this particular episode, yeah, 9-bit pixels and convert them into 24-bit colors. And we're also going to explore block RAM and how that might be useful for doing this. So a quick demo. This is what the circuit that we'll be building today is going to do. And it's just drawing a bunch of lines, but these lines happen to represent entries into the palette. So each palette entry is one of these colors. And then it's just continued down the screen like this. So uh, a bit of a glossary. Uh, as usual, we've got a clock and a reset line. Uh, this is present in most of the circuits that we will be looking at today. There's also splitters and mergers. These either split an incoming bus into a number of outgoing buses or vice versa. They merge two incoming buses or signals or wires or whatever you'd prefer to call them into one larger one. Then of course we've got AND gates and OR gates. Hopefully those are self-explanatory. Uh, we've also got a counter in this and I'm going to use the built-in counter. So there's an enable line, an output line, and an overflow. And the overflow goes high when it's about to roll over to the beginning again. We're going to use a built-in RS latch in this, or RS flip-flop, or I guess it's technically a register as well. Uh, there's going to be some registers or D flip-flops. Oh, I forgot to label the outputs on the, on the latch. Well, the outputs are the same as the register. The Q output is that and then the Q with the bar over it is the inverted output. There's also multiplexers and this is the selector input. We also have an appearance from read-only memory and there's also going to be dual port block RAM. And I'll get into that in just a moment, what that means, but it basically means that there's two separate data and address ports. So let's get into why a palette or a palette, uh, however you prefer to pronounce that. Uh, well, we're going to probably use 640 by 360 as our base resolution. Uh, it can be any resolution. I'm just picking that because it's an even multiple of 720p and 1080p. So if we were to store all 24 bits of the color data separately, then that'll use up 5.5 megabits or 691 kilobytes. And if we have 691 kilobytes in our RAM, then that's fine. And most modern computers do. And so this is the method they choose to go with. It's very rare to find any graphics cards these days that still use palettes. So generally speaking, modern systems use this method. They don't bother with palettes anymore. This is a very retro thing to do. But well, we kind of want to do retro, right? We want to do it the way they used to do it, and it has the added advantage of saving quite a bit of memory. So if we have instead only nine bits to represent a color, so it can be one of 512 colors, but each of those colors can be 24 bits, then that'll only take two megabits of memory space or 259 kilobytes. Well, that's a lot better, but we can do even better than that. and that's by using only four bits for the color. So one of 16 colors, but there's going to be a trick later on in future episodes to get away from 16 colors and use a few more colors than that. But that'll get us down to 115 kilobytes. And actually, I would like to try to stay within about 128 kilobytes. One of the FPGAs that I'm thinking about using actually only has 128 kilobytes of memory on board. So staying below that is very appealing. And the nice thing about that FPGA is that 
that memory is included right within the same chip. So that means that it's very inexpensive to build a VDP out of it. And in fact, I'm really leaning towards using that FPGA for this purpose. So keeping the memory size down is definitely an advantage. So you can think of a palette as a 9-bit to 24-bit lookup table. So it's just converting 9-bit pixel data into 24-bit color data. Uh, now, block RAM. An FPGA has a bunch of block RAM devices on it. And so I should probably talk about what is block RAM and why you would want to use it. Uh, well, this is kind of a symbol for block RAM. So the ICE-40 FPGA has block RAM. It's got two ports and they each have their own address and data buses, can be written to and read from simultaneously. That means that within the same clock cycle, we can have the CPU write to it while the VDP reads from it, which is very handy. It's synchronous though, that's the downside, in that if you try and read from it, you'll get the result of that read one cycle later. And likewise, when you're writing to it, it's not actually stored until the next cycle. So that's a downside, but we can work with it. So it's typically either 256 16-bit words that are stored in it, or 512 bytes that are stored in it. You can configure it to other sizes, but those are the main sizes that we'll use in this project. And you can combine multiple block RAMs into larger ones. So if you need more than 256 words, you can combine it into a larger one. Or if you need wider than 16 bits, you can combine it, say, into a 32-bit or 64-bit memory array. And the FPGA I'm currently using has 32 of these. I think the one that I just mentioned that has onboard memory has fewer than 32. So we have around 32 of these available to us. And so those are 32 memory devices that have independent read and write ports. So that's really handy. That means that we can have multiple block RAMs used throughout the circuit, and each of them can be written to and read from in the same cycle. And that will be very important later. So we'll be making extensive use of this since it's one of the powerful features of FPGAs and one of the reasons to use an FPGA for this. Uh, you can do this in discrete logic too. You just need multiple RAM chips. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, another important thing with block RAM is that it can be pre-initialized with data, which means a block RAM can also act like a ROM. And actually using block RAM as ROMs is much faster, although you have to deal with that one cycle delay. So that's kind of the background. And let's get into building this circuit. So let's figure out what we need to do here. We have our pipeline and in the engine, well, obviously we need to replace this. And I kind of like to rearrange the pins a little bit as well. So let's do that. Okay, there we go. We have our pins arranged so that we can make some nice looking buses out of this. There's actually two parts. And the first part, I'm just gonna wire everything on the input to the output essentially, because we won't be doing that yet. And then in the second part, that's where we'll be implementing our circuit today. So let me do that. Okay, so I have two modules here, and the first one is the draw module, and we won't be working on this this episode, but it just takes the inputs and wires them directly to the outputs. The line and frame is only used by this module. It doesn't need to be sent back to the outputs. And then in the render module, we have a blank canvas and we can start working on it. Now you may notice that the X and Y is being sent to the output. This is mainly useful in simulation. It's not as useful in the actual FPGA, but because these outputs won't be connected to anything, they will just be optimized away. So we don't need to worry about those. So I'm not super convinced on these names. We have one module that will draw all of the sprites, and we have one module that will take the drawn sprites and render that on the screen. So I'm not sure 
Maybe I'll come up with better names, but for now this will work. So let's start filling this out. I think actually this module makes sense to be a series of sub-modules as well that are set up in a pipeline. So I'm going to do that. Okay, so I haven't done the other module yet, but I have done this module. So it'll be a series of these transformations from one kind of data to another. In here, I have the beginnings of a pipeline set up. So the inputs need to be delayed by a single clock cycle into the outputs. So we want to delay the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, H sync, V sync, and the display enable. And this is because the memory that we plan to use takes a single clock cycle to load the value. So if you look at this circuit, you'll see that it's just some code, and that's all it is. Uh, what this code does is it draws a circuit. And if I stop, then the circuit disappears. And if I change the initialization parameters here, I can make it produce more registers. And likewise, if I change the initialization parameters here to reduce it, I can make it create less. So I'm not going to go into depth on how to actually program up a generic circuit using code, but the language is very similar to Java. The only difference is this colon equals is used to initialize variables. And in this language, you can use the documentation to figure out what the components configuration settings are. And then you can use add component to create them, etc. There's some documentation on this here. Uh, if you search for generic, uh, it kind of gives you a rundown. It doesn't describe how the language works, but it describes how you can add wires and add components. And it tells you that there's some example circuits that you can look at. So I've started to use this technique a lot more to make it easier to reuse things that I would use a lot. For example, building a set of pipeline registers. So that's what this is. So we have our pipeline regs, and the configuration is in here. We've got two 12-bit registers and three 1-bit registers. So the 12-bit registers are the X and Y. And then we have three 1-bit registers for the remaining signals. And then it just pipes that to the output. So this is a good beginning, but we want to actually load the color itself. So let's do that. All right. So this will be familiar over here. We're just making sure that we're emitting zero or uh, blank when we're in the blanking area. And I'm just taking the X coordinate and I'm using that as a temporary pixel. And that's going into our palette. So in our palette, all we have is a ROM and a register. And the register is here because ROMs are asynchronous in digital, but in the FPGA, they're synchronous, which means they're registered. And I believe the register is actually on the address and not the output, but it doesn't really matter. But one major issue that you might notice is that this is a ROM, and I'm going to fix that in just a bit. So this actually needs to be dual port memory where we're able to write to it from the CPU. And currently we, that's not possible if it's a ROM, but I have an idea on how to fix it. And I'll test that idea in a moment, but we have it set up so that we can actually test it. So let's do that. So let's back out to the top level here. Here we go. And there we go, it works. So it's just a bunch of lines currently, and the pattern repeats all the way down the screen, but this is definitely a good beginning. Let's see if we can fix the issue with the palette being read only. Okay, here we go. So I've replaced the ROM with a dual port RAM, 
and I've added the ability to write to the memory. And what I did was in here, I set this as program memory. And what that'll do is it'll allow you to specify an initialization value for it. Now this initialization value is not exported to Verilog, but I have a solution to that. So this is set to program memory. And then in the circuit specific settings up here, we have preload program memory at startup. So what that'll do is if there's any memory devices that are marked as program memory, it will load a program file for it. In this case, our palette. So I also have this skip in Verilog VHDL export. And this is actually a feature that I added to digital to allow this specific use case. So when exporting to Verilog, this circuit will be completely skipped, but you can still instantiate this circuit and the instantiations stay. So you can provide an alternate implementation of this module in Verilog. And so we can use the memory primitives that the FPGA supports in this alternate implementation of this module. So let's test this and see if it works. Oh, we need to fix this up. I will do that. Okay, so I just fixed that up and I also added a prefix of pal to the write enable since we're going to have several write enables in our circuit and it'll help keep everything straight. So, and this is kind of bugging me. I'm just gonna center it. Okay, all right, so if we go all the way up to the top again, we should be able to run this again. Oh, but it's blank. Hmm, why would that be? Let's check out what's in our memory. Oh, it's all zeros. Great. Hmm. I'm just gonna troubleshoot this for a moment. Well, there's some bad news. It looks like if we look in here, our memory is not initialized. But if we go inside this circuit and we run it here, then it's fine. So that throws a monkey wrench in things. If we look in our circuit specific settings, this setting here, the preload program memory at startup only seems to affect uh, the current circuit when you're running this current circuit. That is not what I was hoping it would do. So I guess the other way to implement this is to have a ROM that copies the contents into the RAM on start, which is a lot more complicated than I wanted to do. But let me see if I can take a stab at that. Okay, so this is what I've come up with. So this is a 16-bit processor, and the VDP that I'm building is also 16 bits internally. So because it's 16 bits, I wanted to split the block RAM into a 16-bit one, and uh, we don't need an alpha channel. So the second one is only 8 bits because it's just got the blue component in it. So the first one will contain red and green, and the second one blue. and so because of that, we need to look at the least significant bit in the address and decide which block RAM to actually store the value in. So that's what these AND gates do. This one checks to see if the least significant bit is zero, hence the inverter on the input. And if it is, and we're writing, then it activates the first block RAM and writes to it. Otherwise, if it's a one, then it activates the second one. And the second one only has eight bits, so it just ignores the upper eight bits of the word that's stored into it. And then for the pixel, it just goes straight to the address of the read port and reads that out. So it reads both block RAMs at the same time. It goes into this uh, merger, I guess, to merge the 16 
bits and the 8 bits to produce 24 bits, and then the 24 bits comes out. So in here, I've inserted an extra circuit, and this extra circuit is all of the logic required to work around the fact that you can't pre-initialize these with specific values like you can in the FPGA. So in here, we've got the circuit that basically does that, and I'll just turn it on and you can see it working. So what it's doing is there's a counter here and the counter is iterating over all of the address. As soon as the counter overflows, as you see right now, it sets this RS latch and the RS latch basically turns the whole circuit off, including using these muxes to switch the address and the data inputs from the ROM to the actual inputs of the circuit. And of course, with the write enable, we want the write enable to be active while we're preloading the circuit. So if I reset it, then it'll do it again. And you can see the write enable is active until it's done. And you can see that it's outputting address and data until it's done. And then now it's using the inputs. So now if we change these, that's what it'll do on the output. So this ends up taking mm, 1,024 clocks, but that is basically a tiny blink in time when you're running this at full speed. And what I've done in here is I've changed the 24-bit values to 16-bit values. And it's, of course, little endian. So I think this might be big endian. I don't know. I'll check and make sure that I'm doing this correctly later. I might have to switch things around. If I switch these around in here, then I need to switch where the knot is on here so that it activates the other block RAM instead. I'll do some research and make sure that I'm getting my endianness correct. But uh, yeah, so I guess a demo. There's a few changes in here, nothing major, just mainly sending the reset into here. And if we go up to the top level, it runs. Yay! And you'll notice that you didn't even see the palette loading. It takes quite a while for this to actually start displaying. And in that time, it already loaded the palette. So you don't see it. So in this episode, we got some colored bars. And hopefully in the next episode, we'll be able to get something a little bit more interesting on the screen. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day. Bye.